Um, good afternoon, everyone that has uh, joined so far. Hello there. Um, we're just going <clears> to <throat> give people a few minutes um, so that we can make sure as many people as possible can join this webinar before we start. And then we'll, we'll get introductions underway um, to the webinar and, and, and start to go through the topics. But um, thank you to the people who've joined so far and uh, we'll just wait while more, more join us. So while, while we're waiting and, and um, people are joining, I think it's just useful to give a little bit of an introduction as to what we're going to cover today on the webinar. The first thing to mention is that we, we want to try to talk about how founders and management teams build valuable businesses. Clearly, that is a very broad topic, and uh, it's not possible in a webinar to go into every aspect of what drives value within businesses. But what I want to aim for is that the attendees can come away from today's session with at least some guidance on the things that they can start to look at and some practical steps that they can start to make. And probably one of the first things that we're going to cover is what is it enterprise value? And really all you need to know at the outset of this webinar is that enterprise value just means looking at a business holistically. It means looking at the business as a whole to arrive at a valuation of it. And then how you use enterprise value as a framework for growing the business is looking at all the different aspects of your business and how they all contribute to the value. So that, that's all that enterprise value means. Um, it means looking at the business as a, as a whole and taking it holistically as you try and, and drive value through the business. I think just also a word why before we get underway and, and more people are joining on, on really who this workshop is designed for. It's clearly designed for owner operators of businesses, entrepreneurs, founders, people who are at early stages of starting a business. But, but probably more importantly than that, it's really designed for tech businesses that are looking to scale and grow very quickly. The reason for that is um, tech businesses or tech enabled businesses uh, require a lot of capital up from. Because of that, a typical journey for a, a tech entrepreneur is to raise investment into their business to help them grow, to help them build their technology before they can start selling it. That means taking on shareholders, that means um, already at the very start, uh, adopting a slightly more complex business where enterprise value really comes into its own. So th th there's also a lot of value in, in, in more analog traditional business models, um, but, but those tend to have less complexity in it, especially if it's just got a founding team of one or two people. Um, you'll still be able to get value from the topics we're going to cover today, um, but by nature you will have slightly less complex businesses that have slightly less risk involved in them potentially. Um, so I just think that's a useful caveat to, uh, to mention before we start. Um, so I think that we're a few minutes past our start time. So I think that we'll, we'll, we'll get into the meat of the, um, the webinar. More people will join. Um, having done that introduction, I'd also just like to um, a, a short introduction into, uh, into Dragon Argent as a business. So Dragon Argent is a boutique professional services consultancy. Um, we specialize in advising early stage high growth businesses. Uh, a lot of our um, clients are therefore by definition tech enabled business, businesses, although we ourselves are sector agnostic. And really our proposition is about offering very joined up accountancy and advisory and legal support to our clients. Why that has so much value attached to it is because traditional experiences for founder, founder and owner operators is having to go to separate uh, accountants, tax advisors, legal advisors, get, getting advice from each of those places and then joining it up themselves and trying to make decisions off the back of that. Um, we're a small but very uh, diverse team of, of professional um, advisors that work together to give that advice in a very joined up way to our clients. Um, and and that, that does prove to be really valuable and it enables us to, to work at the pace that suits the clients, be aware of the, the commercial objectives that they're trying to achieve um, and really be um, a problem solver under one roof. And I think that's, that's our proposition. Um, in terms of an introduction to myself, uh, before join, joining Dragon Argent, 
I set up and founded my own business in 2013 um, with two co-founders. I spent seven years um, building that business before I exited, in, uh, exited it in 2020. Um, I've therefore lived and breathed a lot of the challenges and probably made a lot of the mistakes that I'm going to try and advise you against on this webinar today um, of people who are starting businesses now. Um, since being at Dragon Origin, I've then kind of been on the other side of the fence in respect of working with a team of um, professionals, solicitors, accountants, and providing advice to clients. I think those two things together give me quite holistic, a holistic set of experiences, um, again, in respect of the journey that people starting and building their own businesses go through. So I hope that that qualifies um, me to, to, to run this webinar and to share some of what I've learned through those two things. Um, prior to that, I've always been in sales and marketing. I have a commercial background. I've built businesses um, in a number of different industries and sectors and, and built teams to, de you know, to deliver those businesses. So I've always, always had commercial roles. Um, so the, the first question that I want to ask, and I appreciate on a webinar, it's difficult to get um, interaction for people to answer this in, in a real sense. But the first thing that I would like you to consider is, when do you think it's important to start thinking about building value in your business in a holistic sense? Hopefully from day one, and this will be one of the things that comes up a lot through this webinar, you should be thinking about value from obviously the, the day that you start it. I mean, that's one of the main objectives of starting a business is how it can be commercially viable and, and be successful. But at what point do you then start to think about building that into a framework um, a business plan, if you like, to continue making um, uh, inroads into, into building the value of your business. Um, some people might do that when they have decided that they want to exit from it. Is that the right time? Some people might think that they should do that in the build up to an exit, so a few years out. Some people might start thinking about it when they commercialize the offering. So when they become commercially successful, they start generating revenue. Others might think about doing it from the day one when they start. Um, as I've re referenced, my strong recommendation is that people think about the things that we're going to cover in the webinar today from the first day of incorporating the business from day one. The reason for that is because the longer that you await to address some of the things that we're going to cover, the harder it becomes, the more costly and the more time consuming it becomes to make changes. Best example of this is as soon as you take on an investor, you have an additional shareholder in your business. You then need that person to agree to any changes that you want to make. Um, if you do um, multiple investment rounds, you have multiple shareholders, your cap table becomes more complicated. It's harder to get those things agreed to. Uh, you have a window of opportunity before you raise investment, before your business becomes more complex, to put the framework in place that gives you the ability to make decisions, to drive value in your business, to retain control and ownership of your business, um, and that really underpins the value of the business. So if there's one thing I want you to think about uh, off the back of today's webinar, it's what can I do today to start protecting the value of my business for the long term? Um, so then the second thing is what, what factors typically determine the value of a business? I, I've already started the webinar by saying that enterprise value is a way of looking holistically at the business. Um, other people might answer that question by pointing to either revenue, profit, or EBITDA. Um, I want to take each of those examples and try to explain why on their own, they're not necessarily a reliable indicator of value within a business. Um, and part of the reason for that is so that uh, founders and, and owners of businesses on this webinar don't just think about, okay, in the next 12 months or 24 months, I want to focus on driving revenue because the context for that is really important. So if we take revenue as an example, you could be turning over a million pounds in revenue, but if it's costing you more than a million pounds to capture that revenue, you are obviously a loss-making business. Therefore, you can't look at revenue on its own. You have to understand the wider context of where that revenue is coming from and what it costs to, to capture it. Similarly, if you take profit, you might think, okay, I'm, I'm generating a million pounds in profit and I'm, uh, uh, so therefore I'm, I'm a valuable business. Um, but that is, again, on its own, not a clear indicator. What's a good way to demonstrate that? If you take uh, a, a business like Twitter, which we know is an incredibly valuable business, it took them 12 years to make a profit, but they didn't become valuable after 12 years. They were valuable before that. Similarly, Uber today still doesn't make a profit, yet we know it's an incredibly valuable business. So again, profit on its own is not a good indication of, of value within the business. Um, and finally, EBITDA. 
for those, those of you unfamiliar with EBITDA as a term, it stands for earning before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And it's a widely, widely accepted indicator of performance. So quite often when you see um, business valuations, they will be done on a multiple of EBITDA. Um, however, even that as probably the most uh, often cited way to value a business is not foolproof because, and this is kind of getting into accounting uh, technicalities, but you, there can be debt that's kind of hidden through an EBITDA calculation or unsightly expenses that, again, you, you would, would themselves undermine the value somewhat. So why am I talking about these three areas is because you shouldn't just take those on their own and say, okay, I've got a valuable business because I'm turning over X amount of revenue and X amount of profit. Businesses have to be looked at in a more holistic way to arrive at a value. So then that leads us to enterprise value. So or I'll reference it as EV throughout the webinar. So what, what is enterprise value? As I've, I've mentioned already, it's a more holistic way to look at the value of a company. Typical things that you might include in, uh, in, in enterprise value. Money, when we talk about money, we really mean the investment that's coming into a business. Um, corporate documentation and corporate structure. We're going to talk about those in more detail later on. Assets and IP. What is the value that the business is built on? Um, is it intellectual property? Are you developing uh, you know, uh, software that is unique, that has intrinsic value? Do you have buildings or stock that in the business that have value? How are those protected? People. Uh, we all know that the, the value of a business is often um, first and foremost dictated by the people within the business. How are those people um, onboarded, incentivized, potentially moved on when they're no longer useful to a business. I think a really important thing that um, comes up here is that someone who helps a business go from day one to a million pounds in revenue is not necessarily the right person to help that business then go from one million to 10 million pounds in revenue. So the team changes. And whilst you want to um, tie people into the business when it's appropriate, you also want to be able to have mechanisms to let those people go when they're no longer the right uh, team to take the business forward. And then finally, shareholders. Again, we'll go into more detail about shareholders earlier, but these are the types of things that we, we mean when we talk about enterprise value. And when you own a business, when you're running a business, taking those things together um, when you're thinking about how you're driving value is really important. And that's that's pretty much the topic of the, the webinar today. And that's what I'm gonna to try to, uh, to run through with you. The other side of that um, then is, is, is when you use enterprise value as a framework for growth, it helps protect you from some things. It helps mitigate some things. Um, and the first of those is assumption-led thinking, which I think is, from my experience, has been really important. So valuing a company we've already looked at is complicated because you can't just use one factor on its own. And there can also be different interpretations of those factors depending on who is looking at your business. So valuing companies is much more an art than a science. It's, there is not a foolproof um, uh, calculation that you can do to value every business. It's different and it depends on who's looking at it. Therefore, if you own a business or you're building a business, it's really important you don't make assumptions about what external parties um, might use to value you. It's, it's key that you go out and you speak to people as early as possible, whether it's an investor or an acquirer, to gather information on how external third parties would look at your business and value it. Otherwise, you might spend the next five to 10 years building your business on the basis that someone would acquire it in the future. Um, but if you've not engaged with them, you don't know what it is that they value. So you might be working towards that exit or investment uh, and realize that the opportunity you were trying to capture doesn't exist. So in order to mitigate that, you go out and you speak to people and you gather information. It also mitigates uh, the risk of limited scalability. What do I mean by that? If you build the wrong proposition or you target the wrong audience, you could be commercially successful up to a point, but there might be a glass ceiling on how much you can grow. There's a limited audience for the service or the product that you've developed, um, or there's a, there's a limited amount of revenue that you can drive from that. The downside of that is you then get caught in a situation where you feel trapped by the business that you have built yourself you're making money from it, but there isn't someone who's interested in, the, in facilitating an exit for you. So, so what does your end goal then become? Enterprise value as a framework for growth helps protect you from that. Legal risk we're gonna go into, but the key here is to think about the value that your business is built on. Um, having a legal framework that protects you 
uh, in, in every relationship that you enter into and you have a business is really important. And we'll explain more about that and the accounting risk as aspect later as we go through the webinar. Off the back of doing this exercise, then what you should end up with is, an, is a prioritized operational plan to drive value across your business. It should give founders the tools to pull the levers that have the biggest impact on, on, on value creation. Why is that important? Because for those of you who are running your own businesses, you know that you are time poor. You don't have enough time to do all of the different things that you could do. Therefore, focusing on the ones that have the biggest impact is really important. Using enterprise value as a framework for growth gives you a, a tool to identify what, the, what those things are. Um, and really your job as founders is to judge the point at which it makes sense to invest in those things. Uh, I'm going to use an analogy later on or throughout, throughout the webinar that if you were designing and building your own house today and you had unlimited budget, you would do everything that you wanted to do. You'd have all of the technology, um, all of the fixtures, the fittings, the furniture, uh, solar panels, all the stuff that you wanted would go in there. But it's very rare that any of us would be in that situation where we could do that. Therefore, we have to make decisions on what it makes sense for us to spend money on. And that's really the job that you have when you are leading a business is making the right judgment calls on when to invest in external support. Okay. So I think that the answer in terms of how you drive value through your business using enterprise value as a tool is to think about how external third parties look at your business, either at an investment or an exit event. And typically they will use three, um, three stages of due diligence, commercial due diligence, legal due diligence and financial due diligence. Um, and those are the three things that we're going to spend the most time going through today. And hopefully what you'll take from this is um, ways in which you can protect yourself or mitigate anything that might come out of any of those three stages at the point at which you've got a third party looking at your business. Because what they'll do is if they spot gaps or risk, they'll use those things to drive value down. So on the flip side, if you focus on those things now and build a plan for them, you can drive the value of your business up. And actually, I should have mentioned at the start, um, I would love to get as many questions as possible as we, as we go through the webinar. So please use the, um, the, the, the question tool that is part of Zoom webinars function on the menu bar to submit your questions. And when we get to the end, I will uh, try to go through them. So the final thing I just wanted to do uh, before we go into those three, three areas of due diligence is really paint a picture for you. So for the, those of you who are on the webinar who might be at the early stages of building your business, painting a picture of what you might be trying to get to. Most of us start businesses not because that's what we want to do for the rest of our lives, or well, that's great if that is what you're doing. Most of us start a business because we see an opportunity to exit it and to realize the value that we've created. So let's take a business that maybe has an EBITDA figure of 750K. At that type of point, you might get a private equity investor interested in your business because they see an opportunity to invest their money, take a majority position, build the business over the next three to four years, and then exit it. Uh, they would want to see certain metrics, and two really simple ones that I've included here are a gross profit margin of above 40%, because that means it, that the, the business can drive that EBITDA value at a reasonable margin, and then is making a net profit margin of 10%. They found an audience, a customer uh, audience that is prepared to pay for the proposition they've created, and they can make reasonable margins off doing that. Using a multiple, an average multiple of about five and a half times EBITDA gives the, the business a total consideration of about four million pounds. That, that is a considerable sum of money. Other people might have much more ambitious plans, but four million pounds for one or two founders is a great outcome from starting your business. The reason why we're talking about enterprise value today is because you want to protect that value through the life cycle of the business and on exit. You want to mitigate the number of things that an interested third party might be able to point to to drive that value down. So this is the picture that we're painting of what we're trying to achieve and why thinking about this stuff today is so important. Um, so just as an introduction then to commercial due diligence, um, I wanted to mention a, a pushback that I see very commonly for clients of ours who are raising investment. That's usually their first um, experience of going out to external parties and asking them to agree on the value for their business. It's when they raise that first, that first investment. All too often, I think the founders make the mistake of trying to do that too early. 
raising investment becomes the goal for them rather than building the business. So they go out very early and they might get some interest, but all too often the feedback that they'll get from investors is thanks, but the business isn't mature enough for us yet. We can't see the commercial validation. And so we're going to pass on it. Um, the first thing that I want to mention before I go into the detail of, of product market fit is as a founder, focus in the earliest stages of the business of building a commercially viable business. That means going out and, um, and, and building revenue effectively. Um, and I think in terms of kind of milestones that we see quite often, especially for software or technology businesses, it's about getting to a point where you might have say 25,000 pounds in MRR, which is monthly recurring revenue. That's the point at which say a VC investor would probably become interested in your business. And if you've got a more traditional business model, then it's annualized revenue of about a million pounds. So we're at the point at which you can forecast that you're going to turn over about a million pounds. That's when interested third parties are gonna be looking at your business. Um, so getting to that point really before you start thinking about raising investment is really sensible because investors take you seriously and they will see the opportunity. Until that point, there would probably be too much risk in them, in, involved in it for them. And the other thing that I would mention at this point from my experience is, uh, as a business owner, you want to put yourself in the strongest possible negotiating position whenever you can. And that means having the ability to walk away from deals. You don't want to be dependent on a deal going through because you, you know, the business needs that money. It's about to run out of cash um, or because you've gotten to a point where you have to exit the business no matter what. If you put yourself in that position, you really have no control over the deal or the valuation of your business. So you, you want to get your business fundamentals um, as strong as they can possibly be. Um, and so in practical terms, there's two mechanisms that you can use to do that. The first is product market fit. So what is product market fit? Product market fit is about demonstrating that uh, you have a product or a service that uh, a market is prepared to pay for. And there are four elements to it, which is value proposition. Value proposition is the promise of value that you're going to deliver through your service or product. And it's communicated and acknowledged by, by clients um, how it will be delivered, experienced or acquired. So what is your value, value proposition? What is it that you're selling? Can you communicate that really clearly? Is it very obvious what it is? And is there intrinsic value in that? The second is market segmentation. What is the size of your addressable market? I, have you been able to identify the segments within that market that contains high yield potential clients? Um, can you identify shared characteristics that those clients or those customers have, such as geographic um, region, their demographic, their interests, their needs? Um, and then finally, the channel. How do you identify the most effective channels through which to then um, target that audience to sell your product? Those four things together, if you can communicate that in a defensible way, so you can explain to a third party, um, this is our value proposition, this is the market that we're targeting, this is my relationship with that market, and this is how I reach them, then you can demonstrate product market fit. And that is the first area that uh, an external third party like an investor would want to check. So it's really critical that you, that you think about product market fit and how you demonstrate it. Because um, if I go back to the introduction to the commercial due diligence, that's usually the first hurdle that people fall at. Um, and, and, and obviously uh, something else here is that, that this is kind of a, uh, uh, it's a precondition. You, know, you, you don't really have a business until you've got customers that, are, that you're deriving revenue from. So this is kind of the first things that you have to do. Um, the second thing that that then, that then leads into is the go-to-market strategy. Um, again, I've, I've chosen kind of five headlines here for a go-to-market strategy. To be perfectly honest, we could have a 60-minute webinar talking about this topic alone. Um, so we're just going to look at it at a very high level. But again, I hope what you take from this is a few key things that you can start thinking about within your business. So a go-to-market strategy is the next phase on from your product market fit and it focuses much more about the way in which you're bringing your product or service to market. It will generally include a business plan outlining the target audience, the marketing plan and your sales strategy. Um, and as I say, a best in class go to market strategy has lots of, lots of uh, different elements, but the ones that I focused in are on are um, below and I'll just talk through these and give you a little bit more detail. So there's the, the buying center and personas. 
Um, so who is your customer? I mean, that sounds very simple and, and in part that's dealt with in product market fit. But here we're going into a little bit, oh, sorry, just skip forward there. If we're going into a little bit more detail. So what remit and title do they have if you have a B2B proposition? Um, what kind of company do they work for? Where are they based? What is their decision-making process? What is their sign-off process? How many people are involved in that? It's really important you understand the way in, in, in terms of who buys your product and the way in which they buy it. The next one then is value matrix. Um, a value matrix is essentially a breakdown of the highest priority business problems or opportunities that you are either seek, seeking to help someone capitalize on or protect them from. Um, so the reason that that's important is because that informs all of your marketing messages, essentially, how you communicate what you do to your, your, your target audience. Um, and whilst this isn't necessarily a particularly complex step on its, on its own, it does require very careful thought. People make buying decisions based on emotion. So what emotions can you play to in, in, in regards to what you are selling and how you sell it? Um, the next step is test and optimize. So you have to be able to show to an interested third party that you understand the best ways to communicate that message and to the right audience. Um, and you can only do that if you test uh, uh, different ways of marketing and different ways of communicating what it is that you do. So that requires research. It requ requires running things like A-B test campaigns. Um, it requires being able to capture um, analytical information about your marketing efforts and having that. And again, it's all about for the, the external party being able to sense check um, that you know what you're doing. Uh, the fourth area is customer journey mapping. So what is the journey that your customers go on that leads them to a buying decision of your product? Um, what things, you know, where, where do they find you? How do they proceed through the buying journey? Um, where do they experience friction? How can you remove that? Where do they require more information? It's really understanding that journey that customers go on and again, being able to communicate that. And then the final one is sales strategies. So all of the other four areas are kind of like the foundational work towards building a go-to-market strategy. And then the final one is then the sales strategy that will convert interested parties into revenue, convert leads into customers. Um, and all of that is wrapped up in your go-to-market strategy and that is effectively your business plan. So if I, I'm interested in investing in your business, I want you to be able to demonstrate that you've got commercial traction and I want you to be able to show me that you've got a plan to continue building the business and securing more revenue. That's what your product market fit and your go-to-market strategy are about. And for me, that is like the core of commercial due diligence. So if you haven't thought about those two things before, in terms of demonstrating commercial value, they are definitely the two exercises to go through and get in place. Um, so that leads us on to then the second stage of due diligence, which is legal due diligence. So what legal due diligence is really about is it's looking at all of the different relationships that your business has with different stakeholders. Um, and there is a number of different documents that you could have in place, but then it's about under or checking that any risk that's involved in that relationship, you are protected from adequately. You've got appropriate, robust, fit for purpose agreements in place. And I've included some examples here. So just starting off at the top, your articles of association are the bylaws of your company. Um, every single company that is uh, incorporated with Companies House will adopt model articles, um, but then you can also go on to make those model articles bespoke for your business, um, and they dictate the bylaws on which your company operates. That is a public document that anyone can view. You then have a private document, which is your shareholders agreement, and that dictates the relationship, the obligations, the rights that shareholders in your business have. Um, and we're gonna talk about that document in particular in a lot more detail. That's really a key document in terms of value. Um, and then there are other uh, agreements that you might have, a, a director service agreement, employment agreements, commercial agreements between your suppliers and customers, whether that's, um, you know, if you sell software, you'll have a SaaS agreement. If you have an e-commerce platform, you'll have terms and conditions. Um, prospective clients, you might enter into a non-disclosure agreement with, um, so there's lots and lots of different agreements that you have, and together, that is, that is the legal framework on which your business operates. And that legal framework, as I mentioned, needs to be robust, fit for purpose, and it needs to protect you from risk and, and retain as much control of that founding team as possible. Um, where, where we sometimes as a business at Dragon Argent receive pushback is, 
Um, a founder that's recently incorporated the business might come and ask us about drafting a shareholders agreement. And typically a shareholders agreement might cost between two and three thousand pounds to put together. And that feels expensive when you're just starting out. But if in two years time you've got a business that is valued at a million pounds and you've got a really tight bespoke shareholders agreement that dictates the relationship between shareholders, then you are protecting that, that value, that two million pounds of value. Um, if you don't have that, then that create, can create all sorts of problems because it doesn't dictate the obligations that shareholders have to each other. So if I'm a shareholder in a business and I decide that actually I don't want to live in the UK anymore, I'd much rather live in Australia where the weather's nice, if my shareholders agreement doesn't deal with how that type of situation should be handled, um, you know, I might upset my founder, but they'll really have no recourse as to how to deal with that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's just an overview of, of, of the legal due diligence phase, but there are a couple of areas that I want to go into into a bit more detail. Um, and really, one of the areas that we spend a lot of time um, consulting clients on is their, their court company structure. So we, we're going to look at this a little bit back to front, but consider what the future of your business might look like. Um, what type of opportunities are likely to arise if you build your business in the way that you hope to and that you become successful? Uh, might you have overseas operations? Might you sell in other um, territories? Might you enter into joint ventures? Uh, might you have diverse trading activities where different parts of your business do slightly different things? Um, what assets and IP is the value of your business built on? And what operational and commercial risks might you encounter or enter into? Um, when you have an appropriate company structure in place, what that enables you to do is take advantage of those opportunities or protect yourself from risk associated with those opportunities. What this essentially comes down to is having a holding company structure where you have a holding company where all of the value of your business resides. So all of the intellectual property that is owned by the business sits in the holding company. Any assets that the business has like buildings sit in the holding company. Um, your shareholding sits in the holding company. That's where all your shareholders have their equity in the business and the investment goes into it. But then operations happen in subsidiaries. So if you have a UK operation and a US operation, you have separate operating subsidiaries for those companies. And what that means is if, if I go into the US and I create an operating company for my US operations, if I employ people, if I uh, have commercial agreements, which I enter into, if I take a lease out on a property, if, the, if I then get into any kind of um, litigation situation or any kind of um, uh, dispute, the dispute is with the operating company, not with the, the holding company as a whole. And I therefore ring fence um, uh, that issue to that operating company and the value that my business is built on uh, sits in the holding company. On the flip side of that, if I have an amazingly successful US operation that's making a lot of money and I get an interested third party come to me and ask to buy that from me, acquire it, I'm able to sell that operating company on its own you know, um, retain um, my ownership and my control of the holding company and any other operations that I've got going on and to deal with that disposal in a very tax efficient way. So that's just a small example of having an appropriate company structure gives you the flexibility to either enter into or exit from op operations and protects you from risk. Um, and the key here is that this, the, the more mature your business becomes, um, the more complex it becomes, the harder it is to change your company structure. Um, it becomes very complex and time consuming and costly to do, especially after you've onboarded investment. Uh, why? Because at the point at which you onboard investment, you have to get uh, the agreement of any shareholders that you have to make changes to your corporate structure. So it's crucial to get this right from the outset. And actually, the earlier you do it, the more of an administrative task and therefore low cost it becomes. Uh, and the final point I think really to make here is that having the, an appropriate corporate structure also protects some of the tax statuses that you might be interested in, like SEIS, R&D tax relief, and EMI schemes that you might set up for employees. Um, so there's, again, there's a whole conversation that you can have around corporate structure. We've touched on the basic premise of it now, but that, that is definitely an area that I would recommend that, that you think about. So in, in summary, <clears throat> when we talk about the legal framework, we're talking about protecting the value that the build, business is built on and 
baking in the flexibility for you to take advantage of opportunities as they arise in the future as you build your business. It's about making sure that founders uh, retain control over their business by having an appropriate shareholders agreement in place that gives them the appropriate rights. And again, that's that that goes into things like drag and tag, where if you want to make a decision, you only need to get a certain number of votes in order to drag the rest of the shareholders along with you. Um, if you know, we would go into a far more detailed conversation about that, but that's just an example of what you might want to put into a shareholders agreement. Um, but it makes sure it protects the value that your business is built on, whether that's intellectual property or physical assets. And so doing your own kind of legal due diligence process, looking at the relationships that you have and, and that you've entered into and ensuring that there is a proper fit for purpose legal agreement um, to govern that relationship is really, really important. And that brings us into the third area, which is accounting due diligence. Um, so, the, so this is really about uh, ensuring that what you think you know about the financial health of your business and how you communicate that to interested third parties is in fact true. Um, and it's about making sure that you use best practice uh, accounting treatments within your business. Obviously, that's best done by a qualified accountant. Um, there are some things in, in the in accounting sense that you have to do, compliance related things like VAT returns, payroll and um, year end corporation tax. You have to do those, otherwise you'll get in a lot of trouble with HMRC. And there's other things that you do that are value adding, like producing management accounts. But this is about the overall approach to accounting. Uh, why is it important? Because unless you are you know, producing your accounts properly, you, you are not able to make informed decisions about your business. If you don't know what your VAT or corporation tax position is, for example, and you invest that money in marketing or hiring someone, clearly you're gonna have a cash flow problem. Um, and in some instances, uh, not understanding what is happening uh, in the finances of your organization can be terminal because you can make really bad uninformed decisions. Um, uh, as I say, that you, when you come to year end or it's time to pay your corporation tax bill, you realize that you don't have the money to do it. Um, so there's, there's, some, there's some specific things that I just want to touch on in here that are, are tied into this idea of value. Um, the first is, is revenue. So again, if I'm interested in your business, I'm not just interested in the amount of revenue that you are generating. I'm particularly interested in the quality of that revenue. So is it repeatable? Is it predictable? And is it growing? Um, so you can take two businesses that are generating a million pounds in revenue, but they can have completely different valuations because if one of them is heavily reliant on a small number of clients, They've actually, they're actually growing, uh, sorry, they're actually um, shrinking in terms of how much revenue they're generating. Um, and the, the way that they secure that revenue is haphazard and difficult to predict. They're not gonna be as valuable as a company that is, that is growing steadily, that has a lot of diverse mix of um, clients that they make that revenue from, and that they maybe it's subscription-based, so it's very predictable and very repeatable. That's gonna have a lot higher value. So that's going to be one of the first areas that I will look into if I was investigating your business and trying to arrive at evaluation of it. Um, they also want to look at those compliance related matters. So have you been calculating your VAT accurately? Um, do you have a VAT um, liability because you haven't treated your tax appropriately? They're going to look into that and that's why you need really good quality advice. They're going to look at your gross and net profit margins. So do they make sense in comparison to competitors or industry standards? Um, and are you building towards the kind of margins that we looked at a little bit earlier in, in the deck when we had that painting the picture example? Um, and finally, just the general, the general, sorry, I skipped, uh, skipped back, was there, just the general health, the financial health of the company. So I mentioned before that I've made some mistakes in building my own business, and this is possibly a good time to talk about a few of those. So I was actually um, a, a shareholder of, of two limited companies that had exactly the same shareholding with myself and my two co-founders. But with that, they weren't part of the group structure. We didn't get good advice from our accountants that if we were going to have two limited companies, that they should form part of the same group structure. But we were moving money in between those two companies because we own them both. Um, and it made sense for us to do that at the time, depending on where we needed the cash to be, to pay bills or to whatever it might have been. In doing that, what we were inadvertently doing was creating an intercompany loan account. They're two separate legal entities. And when you move money from one to the other, that company was effectively loaning the second company money. And when we came to exit the business and we had a, an acquirer doing due diligence, he noticed this loan account and said, well, look, 
you've got this outstanding loan balance. So that immediately takes that, that equivalent value off the value of the business and off the value of the deal. Um, and we didn't realize that. And, and some, you know, a, a good proactive accountant would have, a good advisor would have, would have told us about that and they would have told us how to prepare for that. Uh, another really simple example is we had a bump a year one, one year and we were able to pay uh, a much higher dividend than, than normal. And I remember going to my accountant and saying, uh, you know, we, we're getting this big dividend. Should, is there any um, income tax implications that I should be aware of? And because they were just very reactive and they weren't at all consultative, they said no, because tax and payroll wasn't really the area that they were looking for. Uh, and that put us personally in a situation where we didn't necessarily have the funds to uh, to pay our self-assessment. And so there's a difference between someone just just doing doing your doing your accounts for you and someone being consultative um, and adding value and helping you to look after the, the general health of your finances. Um, so that's that's the accounting due diligence piece. Um, and the, again, if I just refer back to my experience of exiting my own my, my own company, uh, we as a business we had always invested a lot in um, legal advice, and we really sailed through the legal due diligence process. It, it was done very quickly, and, and nothing of note came out of that. But where we really got bogged down, and, and the sale process took a lot of time, was on the accounting side. Um, we had a relatively complex business. And what the acquirer really wanted to do was to understand where our revenue was coming from down to uh, an individual sale. Um, so show me where that revenue came from. What was the individual? Where's the invoice that um, uh, and, the, and the bank transaction um, that, that sits with this? And we had to go through every element of that in, in a lot of detail. Um, and so it's not just your accounting um, processes that you want to make sure are in good health, but it's also the way that you invoice clients, that you trace that, um, that you take receipt of the, the payment and that you can show that you know where, where a, a, an individual sale came from. And, and all of this comes down to being able to pr prove what you say about your numbers is accurate. Um, and, and trust me when I say that certainly an acquirer, but all, all, also an investor will look at that in a lot of detail and really drill down on that. And that can become very stressful if you're in a pressurized situation, like trying to negotiate an exit from your business. So preparing for that early and putting yourself in the best possible position is, is a strong recommendation. So we've, we, we, we're, we're, we're using up our time. I feel like we've gone through that very, very quickly and covered a lot of ground, um, but we, we have used up quite a, a decent chunk of the time that we've got here. So those are the main areas that people should be, that I think that people should be thinking about when they think about creating valuable businesses. So how do you then turn that into a plan? Um, there's some additional considerations that I think you should focus on that will help with this about how you develop business, the people that you've got in the business, how you deliver that and, and you know, your general strategy or general business plan. Um, but the earlier that you look at this stuff, the earlier that you make honest assessments of it and put that into prioritized plan, the earlier that you'll feel the benefit of it. And then those, those um, changes that you make, it's a bit like uh, uh, compound interest. They comp compound and they multiply over time. So by the point at which you either go out to raise money or you look at a disposal opportunity to exit the business, you get exponentially more value from it. Um, but the last note here is just to say that finally in any startup or SME, it's really essential that the people involved in running the business um, have consensus over what that long-term objective looks like, because the worst thing that can happen is one person's got a very clear view of what they're trying to do, but they are blocked by their co-founder or their shareholder because their view is different the earlier that you can also sit down and talk about the plan that you create and agree that it's the right plan to have so that you can focus on executing it, the better. Um, and the, the final thing to say is that Dragon Argent actually have a tool um, that helps clients uh, get to a point where they, they, have a, they can cut, start to formulate a plan. And that is our enterprise value diagnostic. That essentially involves a sitting, sitting down with the management team of a client and going through 36 questions where we rank the business on, on how good or how poor a particular process is. And what that does is get, it spits out a report that gives us very clear insight into the state of each aspect of the business off the back of which you can create that prioritized plan and start to work on some of those areas that need attention. Um, we do that ourselves at Dragon Argent on a periodical basis, and it is a really, really useful management tool. 
Um, so that's something that we uh, that we would be very happy to talk to any anybody on this webinar about to uh, today. Um, so that takes me to the end of the um, this, the slides that I plan to share. Um, what I would love to do now is to see if we have any questions um, from from anyone. So if you thought of any questions as we've gone through um, the webinar, or you'd like to answer, ask any questions now, um, please do, and I'll do my best to uh, talk through them. So I'll give you a few minutes just to to think about uh, any questions that you might have. Um, okay, it doesn't look like we're getting any questions. So hopefully that's because I was so comprehensive. Oh, we've just got one pop through, brilliant. Oh, I just got some feedback actually, rather than a question. So thank you very much, Leslie, for the feedback. That's very much appreciated. Um, so as, yeah, hopefully I've been so comprehensive that there's, there's no questions that anybody has to ask. I, I suspect that's probably not the case. Um, but after the uh, presentation, we will we'll send out the slides and my contact details. And if anybody would like to, um, to pick this up and get in touch, please feel free to do so. We'd love to engage with um, anybody that was on the uh, webinar today further. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Um, that brings this session to a close and hopefully have the opportunity to follow up with you. Thank you.